the, it's the demolition of order. And well, that's when Isis makes her appearance because she's goddess of chaos. It's like up comes Isis and her husband is Osiris and he's all chopped up. So she goes around Egypt. He's not killed because he can't kill Osiris because he's the dominance hierarchy. You can disrupt it, you can break it into pieces, but it's going to come back together. So Isis wanders around Egypt trying to find his phallus. So she finally does and she makes herself pregnant with it. And so the idea there is that when the pieces of society fall into chaos, they're still alive. So something new can be born out of them, right? It's like the creative destruction that the economists talk about. Isis makes herself pregnant and she gives birth to Horus. Now Horus is Osiris' son, but the big difference between him and Osiris is that he can see. He's not willfully blind. In fact, he's the opposite of willfully blind. He's almost only the eye, the famous Egyptian eye. He's also a falcon. And falcons are those things that fly above and they can really, really, really see. So Horus grows up outside the kingdom. Well, why? Everybody grows up outside the kingdom because the old kingdom is always corrupt and archaic and but willfully blind. So you're always alienated from it. So alienation is like a permanent element of being. But then Horus goes, and because he can see, he sees Seth for who he is, and then he has a horrible fight with Seth, and he wins, and then he banishes Seth. Now, you can't kill him because he's Seth. It's like the fact that dominance hierarchies can become corrupt is an eternal fact, so there's no getting rid of Seth, but you can get rid of him temporarily. So when he gets rid of him, he steals his eye back, and then you think, okay, well, he's got rid of Seth. It's like he's got the kingdom, end of story, but the, that isn't what happens. Horus takes his eye and he goes back down to chaos in the underworld and he finds Osiris down there who's sort of like, you know, he's a ghost, he's a shade of his former self. And Horus gives him his eye. So now Osiris can see with the eyes of youth. And then Horus and Osiris go back to rule the kingdom together. And the pharaoh is Osiris and Horus together, if he's a good pharaoh. So that means he's wisdom and tradition and attention. And that's, that's, you're starting to get very close there. Now the Egyptians identified that Horus Os Osiris thing with the immortal soul. It's like, yes, they're right. And it's not some trivial superstition. It's, it's their right. That is the immortal soul. It's the thing, it's the, it's, it's the best in each person. That's another way of thinking about it. Now, you know, that, those ideas get much more developed as we get much more civilized. So by the end of the Egyptian periods, they call this the democratization of Osiris. Although only the Pharaoh to begin with could sort of use the symbolism that was associated with Osiris Horus. It sort of spread down the dominance hierarchy. So, and then for me, what happens after that is that, well, it starts to get universalized, right? So this is not a particularly linear progression, but for the sake of simplicity, we can make the case. The Greeks give every adult male a soul, right? Well, by the time Christianity rolls around, it's like, oh, huh, isn't it weird? Everybody has a soul. Even the weirdos that you'd rather get rid of, even those things that you think of as enemies. It's like it's in people. Okay, now, Christianity really starts to play around with exactly what the hell this soul is. And they, you know, the ideas come out in very bizarre ways. and. The, the, one of the most bizarre ways is that Christianity makes the assumption that the word of God that, that pulls order out of chaos at the beginning of time, it's the Logos, is the thing that's Christ, you know, so many eons later. They're the same thing. It's like, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, it's like, if you embody the immortal soul pro properly, you're the thing that generates order from chaos or sometimes the reverse, you make, you know, you're the transforming agent that sits at the middle of order and chaos. Okay, so that's the same thing that was there in the beginning. Well, that's the beginning of, of being, not the beginning of the universe. It's the beginning of being. Those aren't the same thing. So, and the Christians figure out that this Logos thing is very much associated with articulated truth. Articulated truth. And so the Christian idea in part is and this is, this is where Nietzsche had it wrong, I think, because he was, he, was, he was too cynical about Osiris. He was too cynical about Christianity. He thought all it was was rotten infrastructure. 
You know, so he, he saw how it had become dogmatized and corrupted across time, but he didn't see what was in the center of it. And, you know, his Superman was sort of a substitute for that. But he never fleshed that out well. But Jung started to play with the Superman idea and with the idea of the Philosopher's Stone, and he was studying Christianity, and at one point he, th he saw, uh-oh, oh, those are the same thing. They're all the same thing. It's complicated, but one of the things that Jung recognized was that the core doctrine of Christianity, in some sense, is the truth buttresses you most thoroughly against the vicissitudes of being. That's your salvation, the truth, the spoken truth. It's not, so you might say, well, people say, Christians say, well, if you believe in Christ, you're saved. Well, what do you mean by believe? Exactly. You say Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you say, I believe that. Just because you say that doesn't mean you believe it at all. It has almost no bearing on what you believe. The question is, how do you act? And the fundamental question that's under all that is, is your speech true? Now, then you might ask, well, what does true mean? And well, and the answer to that would be, there's, it's twofold. What are you trying to do with your speech? There's two things you can do with it. One is, you can manipulate reality so that it does what you want it to do. So, and that's the sort of speech that people use when they're trying to get what they want. The problem with that is that there's no way that they, they can't actually know what they want. They just hypothesize what it is that they want based on some theory, and then they try to manipulate the world so that they get that. But it's an unsatisfying venture, and often when they do get it, it's not good anyways. So, and it involves a kind of falsity of speech. The other way is to try to say what you mean and think and perceive as clearly as you possibly can, always, and see what happens. Now, the, the, the story that underlies Christianity, and it's not only Christianity, but it's Christianity that I'm most familiar with, is that the rule is live in accordance with the truth and see what happens. So in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, Christ basically says, set your sights on allegiance to God. It's like whatever the highest value is, we'll say. And act in a manner that's concordant with that, so that's your goal, then pay attention to the here and now, your best strategy for the future. Well, you know, then you might say, well, prove that. It's like, well, that, that's when the question starts to become existential. It's like, well, you can't prove it, you have to try it. That's like Kierkegaard's leap of faith. You cannot tell if this works unless you do it. And that's a commitment. It's like. Because those two ways of being, like the manipulative way of being, that's an adversarial way of being archetypally. It's manipulative. It's got the lie at its core. That's completely different than this path. So, so it's a hypothesis. Well, it's a hypothesis that Jung did a good job of elaborating. Although, you know, even with Jung, it's not fully articulated. He's still saturated in image to a large degree, but no wonder, it's very complicated to make this, this sort of thing fully articulated. You read Solzhenitsyn, you think, okay, why did the Soviet Union become the absolute hellhole that it was? Solzhenitsyn says, because everyone lied. It's like, oh, isn't that interesting? Well, that isn't a hypothesis that you hear every day. So then you think about Freud and you think, well, what's the major cause of mental illness? Repression. Well, that's a lie, fundamentally. I mean, Freud's played around with it to some degree, so it's, it's sort of like, it's, it's more like lying by omission, actually, than lying by commission. But it doesn't matter, it's still lying. Jung says the same thing. It's like, oh, well, wouldn't it be interesting if the fundamental root of psychopathology was the lie? The fundamental root of political psychopathology is the lie. It's like, well, what if that's what's de demolishing your life? You know, people say, well, people think, especially when they're nihilistic, and they, and they become destructive, that the universe is sort of, it's an unfair and arbitrary place, and it's basically bent on their random destruction while they suffer. It's something like that. Yeah, right. Okay, what do you do under those circumstances? 
That's the question. Well, one potential answer is twist the thing so that you can maybe get what you hypothetically want out of it. The other is rely on your perceptions and your capacity for accurate representation. Communicate that and take your chances. It's like, who's right? Well, that's the battle between good and evil. Who's right? It's a continual battle. <laughs>